Um, my name's uh, Ewan and I'm an interdisciplinary conservation scientist. I've got a background in ecology and spatial conservation prioritisation, but I've spent the last four years working in the Said Business School in the Future of Marketing Initiative, where we work with some of the biggest firms um, on difficult issues around the world of marketing. Um, but in my talk today, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what marketing is and some of the science of behaviour change and why I think that some of these approaches are important to help us foster sustainable human wildlife coexistence. So before I get into the details of my talk, I just want to set some expectations and be clear about what I'm offering here. Just like Diogo, there's no silver bullets um, and I don't have time for a comprehensive review of marketing. But what I am going to talk about is some of the reflections that I've had from my time as a conservationist working in a business school. So I should say that some of you might find some of these observations to be a little bit obvious and if that's the case then I think that's wonderful because I'm gratified by the large number of talks that I've seen over the last couple of days that have really done an excellent job of looking into a lot of these issues but my sense is that the wider field still has quite a long way to come so it's that wider audience that I'm hoping to address today. So. The famous lion biologist George Shallow once said that conservation problems are um, social and economic, not scientific. And what I think he meant by this is that we never want to lose the muddy-booted ecology that underpins so much excellent conservation science. But at the end of the day, um, every issue in conservation, more or less, has at its heart people and somewhere has at its heart a behaviour. And I think this is even more true when we're dealing in the context of human-wildlife coexistence, which has in the title and in its very essence humans baked in from the beginning. So examples of conservation-relevant behaviour changes are really diverse and could be anything. So it could be persuading someone to take an action, whether it's um, putting a net over a fruit tree to protect it from bats. But you might also want to persuade people not to take an action, like shooting hen harriers in a grouse mall. Or it might even be something a little bit more abstracted, where you might want to influence a politician or a policymaker to support or to reject a particular um, piece of legislation. In every case, here there's a behaviour and in each of these cases nudging the behaviours in a positive direction might lead to better outcomes for both people and for wildlife and marketing, behavioural economics, psychology, all of these fields can help us understand why people behave in the way that they do and how to nudge behaviours in a conservation positive direction. So what is marketing and a common misconception that I'm often confronted with is that people often think that marketing is just about glossy adverts and PR campaigns. And of course that is part of marketing, but it's just the visible tip of an iceberg. If you talk to people who work in marketing, what they'll tell you is that marketing is much broader than this, and really what it's about is driving growth in the business. And a study of 10,000 marketing executives from all around the world found that the firms that do this best, the highest performing firms, do this by creating and delivering value for their customers and they do this by putting their customers at the very centre of their operations. So what's all this got to do with conservation? Well, firstly, it shows us that marketing goes beyond um, just these glossy adverts and is fundamentally about a connection with people, identifying their needs and then figuring out how to meet those needs. And then we can look, when we look at it through that lens, we can begin to see how this toolbox of techniques can be useful for people who are interested in behaviours that might bring about more sustainable coexistence. The idea of conservation marketing is something that's been around for a while, and our, and our excellent host, Diogo, wrote one of the sort of early calls for the adoption of these ways of thinking in the conservation literature. But... Uh, how do we go about putting these ideas into practice? Well, 
There are a whole load of um, different textbooks um, that take you through step by step how you might do some of these approaches and I highly recommend any of these to people who are interested. But the critical unifying feature that unites all of these is the principle that we want to start with a behaviour. And so identifying a clear set of behaviours that we want to change is absolutely critical before we can begin to think about all of the stuff that leads to that behaviour. But my contention is that we as conservationists need to do a little bit better and go one step further than this to really link the behaviours through to a theory of change that understands how behaviours influence conservation outcomes. In a small literature review that I did with a master's student of mine, we looked at studies that were interested in behaviour change and almost all of the studies we looked at focused on these antecedents of behaviour, the things that led to behaviours. Some, but not all of the studies, carried this through to looking at behaviour change, um, but almost none of them carried it all the way through to seeing if the behaviour change resulted in any meaningful benefits for conservation outcomes. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand that this is difficult, it's time consuming and it's costly to measure and if you gave me a six-figure budget to do some of this stuff I would, but it takes a lot. And, um, but I do think we need to really think hard about how to measure our impact all the way through from the stuff to behaviour to outcomes. So. I've talked about how we draw that thread all the way through, um, but what about all the stuff that leads to behaviour change? Well, there are no, hundreds of different theories um, and behaviour frameworks that talk about how we can understand how behaviours are formed, and for the purpose of today, I'm going to focus on the theory of planned behaviour. I like this model, it's not the only model, but I like it because it's well supported in the psychology literature and it gives a hint of the complex range of things that feed in together to come up with um, any given behaviour. So according to this framework, behaviours arise as a result of one's behavioural intentions and one's ability to control the situation. So if I'm interested in um, putting nets over my fruit trees, um, I might not do that because no netting is available, or I might not do it because I can't afford the netting. Um, but behavioural intentions arise as a result of a whole load of other things, things like attitudes, so that's whether I think that netting is a good or a bad thing, as a result of norms such as what's my community doing, are they doing netting and, do, and what do they think about netting, and also my perception of my level of control over the issue. So I may think that nets are expensive, but I might not know about an available subsidy, for instance. Now, over the last few days, I've actually seen probably five talks built around this framework, which is wonderful. But in general, when I look at the literature, most of the work focuses overwhelmingly on attitudes and misses out on a lot of the rest. Later in this session, Laura's going to talk about her wonderful work looking at how norms influence livestock management practices in Kenya. And while not specifically a conflict example, I've been working with the IUCN bat specialist group to look to apply this framework um, to field hygiene practices. So in this study, we took a full theory of planned behaviour approach with um, attitudes in red, norms in blue and control factors in green to try and understand people's willingness to adopt best practice guidelines for field hygiene when handling, <coughs> handling bats. And a priori, what we hypothesised was that researchers from um, wealthier parts of the world, their willingness would be dominated or their intention would be influenced by their attitudes about the issue and norms surrounding that issue. Whereas we thought that people in less economically developed parts of the world would be more influenced by issues of control, particularly price and availability of PPE and equipment. Well, having surveyed over a thousand bat researchers from around the world, we discovered that we were right about people from less economically developed parts of the world. Um, the only significant factor influencing their behavioural intentions was control and that focused around price and availability. 
And what surprised us was when we looked at people from more economically developed regions. And in that case, um, what we found was that people were almost entirely motivated by issues of control as well, not attitudes or norms. But in this case, it was about discomfort and about practicality. And so the reason for showing you this is just to say that this gives an example of how you can, looking beyond attitudes, can give you practical insights as to actions you can take um, for future campaigns, whether that's encouraging funding bodies to give more money for PPE in vulnerable parts of the world, or whether it's developing a media campaign that just tells researchers from wealthy economies to just toughen up and stop being such a bunch of softies. But the, so the third and final reflection that I wanted to share with you today is a focus on people. And so right back up at the top of my presentation, um, I said that marketing is about putting customers at the very centre. And in this context, what this really means is understanding the wants and the needs of the people living at the interface with wildlife. Marketers approach this issue through segmentation and targeting. But I think what I really want to talk about is humility. And so no matter who you are or where you work in the world, I think it's vital to put the local community right at the heart of designing and implementing conservation in interventions. <coughs> Yesterday, David mentioned a study where we compared the preferences for species conservation between a relatively affluent group of respondents from an international setting and compared them to people's attitudes living on the edge of Hwangi National Park. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the people who had to live alongside these species had very different perspectives about which, which species should be prioritised, with most high-conflict species being substantially less popular in Zimbabwe. All this might strike you as being a bit unremarkable and unsurprising, but if that's the case, then again, excellent. My point is that these are species that people in the West, in affluent nations, want to see conserved. But they do this with almost no thought to the people who have to live alongside these species. And this thought is brought home to me by a conversation I had with one of the respondents when we were doing these surveys, who earnestly and genuinely asked me how we deal with lions in my village, and I didn't have a good answer for him. In order for any behaviour change intervention to work for conservation, it has to work for its target audiences too. So my conclusions are that Marketing is more than just glossy advertising, and I think this toolbox of approaches can be really valuable for helping us get insights into behaviour and behaviour change. But we need to do more to link our thinking through from behaviours through to end goal conservation outcomes. And we need to think about the full range of factors, not just theory plan behaviour, things like emotions and environmental fatalism and optimism and all these things that lead to a person's behaviour. And then finally, we need to remain focused on really understanding the needs of the communities where we work. So, that's it. Thank you very much, you and yeah, we do have time for questions, for sure, please. Hi, thank you. Very interesting uh, talk, you meant to wake me up. Uh, so, we have a famous story in Israel. In the 1950s, we almost lost all of our natural uh, wildflowers. And they started a campaign with kindergarten teachers, with teachers, and by the 1970s, it stopped. Nobody picked wildflowers anymore. It happened once. So we talk about it every conference in Israel that this is something that we managed to do. We managed to change the behavior of the entire country. But we, since the 1970s, we didn't manage to do that again. And I think that's the challenge. So where are the success stories that we can follow and can reproduce them? Because we always talk about that success story. In the last conference, we said, well, that was the success story. And it was the only one. We can't reproduce that. So how do we pass from one anecdote to a repeated success? Um, I think that's absolutely right, and it's sort of the point of what I was trying to get across with that first reflection that I had, is that I think 
we do quite a good job of showing that a particular intervention can change someone's attitudes or you can show that a particular intervention can result in behaviours. But I've, and I think we do a good job of demonstrating those things and there's a good reason to think that doing them would feed through to conservation outcomes and have measurable impacts at a, at a, from, from a biodiversity perspective and from the benefits of the people as well. But I actually think that the levels of evidence that tie it all the way through are currently weak and it's something we need to do more of and I just think it's a difficult and expensive problem to do that level of research but I think it's something that's important so as we can identify the things that we want to do and that do and do and do not work so so yeah wonderful thank you very much yeah. thank you all right so we're